Hi, this is Rabbi Chase Taub. This is a little intro to warn you. This is the second part of a three-part series on Amuna and anxiety. And this second part is really focused on the problem. Sometimes it's helpful to explain the problem. If you don't understand the problem, you can't fully understand the solution. So if you don't want to hear any more about the problem and about the reasons why many of us are feeling overwhelmed with everyday life and about why we feel stressed and past our limit, if that itself is stressful, then maybe just skip to part three where we're going to talk about the solution. You've been warned. Okay, here's the lecture. All right, so w- welcome back. This is part two, and we're continuing our discussion of emuna, which means faith, and anxiety, which means anxiety. And emuna and anxiety are, did you figure out yet that they're sort of uh, opposites? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, it's sort of a law of inverse proportions. The more amuna, the less anxiety. The less amuna, the more anxiety. Yeah. Um, so I want to reiterate and maybe go a little bit more into depth about something that we, we spoke about last week. Um, if you, and, you, and if you weren't here or if you're watching online and uh, you haven't seen class one, I'll, I'll just tell you one pertinent thought that we shared last week. And that was that um, Hashem, the creator in his infinite wisdom, endowed us with a survival mechanism to alert, alert us to stimuli uh, that may be dangerous uh, so that we can be vigilant and make choices that will, that will keep us safe. And we're, we're grateful that we have that ability. The problem is when that system is working overtime. And we begin to become consumed with it. And then, as we spoke about last week, we even start constructing a mythology. I called it a mythology, a personal mythology, where we make up stories to explain why we feel agitated. And then those stories take on a life of their own and become um, sort of a, a false narrative about our lives. So that, that's, that's what we spoke about last week. Sounds familiar, more or less? Yeah, okay. But I wanted to speak a little bit more about the the alarm system. And I wanted to acknowledge that every single one of us was created differently. Uh, We all look differently. No two human beings have the same exact face, even identical twins don't look exactly the same. And our sages tell us that likewise, in fact, they compare one to the other, just as no two people have the exact same face. No two people have the exact same mind. So uh, we're all wired differently. And uh, there is a range of what's called normal, although I don't know what normal is because no two people are exactly the same. But I guess there's a range within which uh, you're similar enough to everybody else that... um, you're considered normal, whatever that may mean. Um, but we're, we're all, we were all endowed with, with a unique way of experiencing our reality around us. And, and some of us experience it more intensely than others. I, I wrote a book over 10 years ago called God of Our Understanding, Spiritual, uh, Jewish Spirituality and Recovery from Addiction. And in that book, I, uh, I coined a phrase, uh, the, well, the canary in the coal mine is an old expression, but I, I gave it a twist. I, I referred to the spiritual canary in the spiritual coal mine. And what I explained is I was trying to give people an understanding of addiction. I, I think I even mentioned this last week in passing. I said that addiction is self-medication. It's not the addict's problem. It's their best attempt at a solution. It's how they're trying to treat the problem. The problem is being uh, existentially uncomfortable. So the, the drug of choice is a way to distract oneself from that. And I was trying to explain in the, in the book, out of our understanding, like well, why, why does this person need that, uh, that self-medication more than the average person? 
And so I said, you know, in the old days, they used to go down to the mine, and they opened up new areas in the mine, and it would <clears throat> sometimes they would, uh, when they open up a new area, there would be poisonous gas, toxic gas. But the gas is invisible, it's uh, odorless, and uh, therefore it's incredibly dangerous because you don't know it's there until people start dying. So they used to bring a canary down in the mine shaft with them, and the canary would tweet and tweet and tweet. And then if the canary would stop tweeting, they'd go take a look. Oh, why is the canary not? Oh, the canary's taking a nap. No, he's not taking a nap. Everybody get out of here. So why was the canary the first to know that there was poisonous gas in the mine? Is the canary a toxicologist? No, the canary is just sensitive to the same thing that human beings are sensitive to. He's just more sensitive. He feels it first. So that which would have killed the miners... Uh, later kills the canary earlier, and that's the canary in the coal mine. So I, I made an assertion there in the book out of our understanding that the people that we refer to as addicts are troubled by existence. And existence itself. And if you ask yourself, well, how, how can you be troubled by existence itself? Like, if you tell me you have a specific problem right now, okay, I understand that, but you find existence itself troubling? And, and my answer was, as a rabbi, especially a Hasidic rabbi who studied the spiritual, metaphysical, mystical teachings of Hasidus, yeah, you betcha, existence is troubling. If Enoid Malvada, if there's nothing but him, if there's only the one, then having a conscious sense of separation, which we call the ego or the EGO, the edging got out, you bet you that's a problem. So why wouldn't somebody want to numb that or take the edge off of that or be distracted from that? The only thing is most people who are quote unquote normal, they can sort of uh, ignore those pangs of the soul that says like, why do I have to feel separate from the oneness and from the all? And then there are other people who are just more sensitive to it. We call those, or I, I, I refer to them as spiritual canaries. And that's why, and this is what I base this assertion on, we find this really weird, peculiar thing uh, that a spiritual awakening has this uncanny ability to relieve the condition of addiction, alcoholism. And... Why should one have anything to do with the other? And there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. Why is a spiritual awakening uh, related to, to overcoming addiction? And, and I explained very clearly, if somebody has an existential problem, that embodiment itself is painful. Being, being an entity unto myself and conscious of it and aware of it, that itself is causing me pain. And then I find something to self-medicate, to distract myself from that condition. So that's what we call the addiction. But you remove the self-medicating uh, distraction. I haven't really been alleviated of my problem. In fact, I'm left with my original problem, which is existence itself is uncomfortable. However, when you introduce a spiritual awakening, which allows one to have a sense of being at one losing that sense of separate selfhood and becoming united with a with something bigger with something greater with something unifying so this has this very strange um outcome of alleviating these underlying feelings of being uncomfortable in one's own skin and then you don't have to self-medicate because the thing you were self-medicating got cleared up through the spiritual awakening so I, I wrote that book 10 years ago, and I never wrote a follow-up to that book, uh, but if, uh, yeah, yeah, but if I were to write a follow-up, um, well, one, one idea I had right away after it came out was just to take the same book and tear the cover off and put a new cover on <laughs> and take out the word addiction and just give it to everybody. <laughs> but if I were to revisit this subject, I think I might expand some of the definitions 
uh, to include other people who are uncomfortable in their own skin. And I've just become more and more aware of this as the years go by. Uh, and I think there's a lot of overlap between these different labels. Um, somebody pointed out to me, I had a, like a beginning of an awakening of an aha moment uh, five, six years ago, and somebody said to me, um, a woman who's in multiple 12-step programs and then told me that she has Asperger's, and she said, yeah, but I'm sure you've noticed that the rooms are full of people on the spectrum, high-functioning people on the spectrum. And I was like, I hadn't noticed until now. But now that you say that, that makes a lot of sense. Something sort of clicked for me. Um, what, what you're talking about is people for whom the business of life itself is taxing. Not because they have any particular exacerbating situation going on right now, although certainly when there are exacerbators that that certainly uh, makes things even worse. But we're talking about, I'll, t I'll tell you a term, I'll share with you a term that I learned a few months ago. So I, I'm, I'm really into using the term. Uh, it, it, it was very helpful for me. The term is allostatic load. I think it's spelled A-L-L-O-S-T-A. TIC, allostatic load, or allostasis. Um, so that basically means the stress that it puts on the organism just to go about life. And everybody has a different capacity, a different allostatic load that they can handle. And when they get to their, uh, their threshold where they cannot handle anymore, so this obviously causes um, various different uh, dysfunctional responses. Unless somebody quickly diminishes the allostatic load uh, that's being placed upon them. So we would see that, where would you see that? You know, somebody who had gone through something exceptionally uh, stressful, so even somebody who generally is very well balanced and has a lot of tools for living and whose perceptions are very even keel and is not super sensitive and, 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 and overreactive. Uh, but if they go through something really intense, that intense experience could tax them to the point where they are at their allostatic capacity and then they wouldn't be able to function very well until whatever stimuli that are causing this would subside. Right? That, that would, that would we'd all understand that if someone would say to you, you know what, I can't deal with this right now. I'm going through some intensely difficult things right now. And we'd all understand what that means. Okay. What's harder for us to, 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 to understand is when somebody says, you know what, I can't handle this right now or ever <laughs> because not that I'm going through anything super intense. I just... I'm having a really hard time just being here in my body right now, okay? I'm having a hard time just being in the universe, okay? My capacities are totally at their maximum right now, just being here. Like, this, the stimuli is a burden for me. So maybe you haven't noticed, but there's a guy in the third row who's breathing funny. No, I'm joking. That, not right now, but... If there were, I, I would certainly notice it, right? Or the fluorescent lights or, or whatever, you know, the sound of the air coming on, okay? These are things. I told you last week that I have tinnitus, so I even do it internally to my own. <laughs> I'm picking up on stimuli that's not even there. You know, tinnitus is in the brain. It's not in the ear. There's no actual sound. So I'm hearing stuff that's not even there. How much more so I'm hearing everything that is there. A guy told me about, he, he took acid, he took LSD, and he was like, it was amazing. I was walking down the street in my neighborhood, and I walked by the shop, and I looked at the sign, and I noticed every brush stroke in the sign like I'd never seen it before. I said, you have to take acid in order to do that? 
<laughs> like I, I'm, I'm noticing the brush stroke in the sign. Now, what's interesting is I'm noticing the brush strokes in the sign, but I'm not noticing oncoming traffic. So <laughs> I don't really get to control it so much. What I'm really hyper aware of, and it's like driving me crazy. And then there's like basic stuff that everybody else is aware of. And I'm totally clueless, totally clueless, especially, you know, like social cues, you know, that can, that can be a difficult thing. I have to be very deliberate about, about thinking about that. Um, so yeah. And, and you can call it whatever you want to call that. Um, but I'm just, tell, I'm just telling you for me, I, I, I relate to the idea of life itself being inherently, uh, allostatically overwhelming. Okay. And you have people with ADD and ADHD and everything coming, coming at them a mile a minute. And, and so it's not that, it's not that life itself, um, or the, the, the situation itself is particularly intense. It's just like you have people who are just thinking very quickly and they're, they're processing, uh, over-processing, and then one thing distracts them from another, uh, from another thing. And so, yeah, there's going to be a lot of overlap between these types of uh, segments of the population, the addicts and people on the spectrum and people with ADD and ADHD and, and just people who are generally all around sensitive with, with, with things we don't have a term for we don't have a label for we don't have we don't have letters for it yet but you know this the sensitive souls and uh i think that one thing we've we've come to understand more at least i've heard more people talking about it is how trauma can affect people's ability to process regular stimuli. In other words, if I had a traumatic event in the past or a series of traumatic events, like with complex trauma, so my alarm system may be broken to the extent where I'm hypervigilant and I recognize a threat where there really isn't a threat. And I think that's a, a lot more acceptable today. People understand that. I don't even have to really explain that to you. It's interesting which ideas come into fashion in which order? Because if I say that to you today, that, you know, a person could have a traumatic event and now they're hypervigilant and they're recognizing non-threatening stimuli as, as threatening. And I bet you, well, there's probably an overrepresentation in this room because you came to a lecture about ammonia and anxiety. Probably 99% of people here know what I'm talking about. You understand those words, right? Okay, because in the past year or two, I, I started hearing about trauma maybe 10 years ago. Um, I, I was at a... I was, I was at a talk from, uh, from Dr. Uh, Bessel van der Kolk in, in Chicago. Uh, he came to Chicago, was, he was with the Meadows in Arizona, and the, he gave a talk there. I saw him and John Bradshaw from the Meadows speaking there. And that's when I started hearing about about 10 years ago. But it's interesting. So nowadays, everyone knows trauma, trauma, trauma. It's like a very du jour uh, term. I, I, I just want to, though, tell you where probably people are going to start uh, increasing their awareness is that, yeah, there are people who feel things that aren't really there or they feel a level of intensity that isn't really there because their system, their, their, their senses were broken because of trauma. I want you to understand also, and I believe that science will, will especially popular science, uh, for all I know, this already is proven in science, but I want to, well, who am I? When I say science, I mean popular science. I mean, whatever I glean from secondhand from whatever TED Talks are popular nowadays, right? But I believe that people will start to realize that it's not just trauma that causes people to feel things overly intensely. I think that people will start to realize that even people who don't have a specific trauma uh, or maybe if you really like to use the trauma narrative to describe it, I would say there are people for whom embodiment itself is the trauma. And in fact, I, 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 I passed this idea in front of a trauma, uh, trauma expert. I was speaking to uh, Dr. Reggie Melrose, and there's a video of an uh, interview that I, I engaged in with her where I asked her some questions. But uh, 
I, I, I believe it's in the video. I asked her if there are people for whom embodiment itself is the trauma, and she agreed that that was something that exists. So here, here's what I think we're going to increasingly understand, that maybe you became hypervigilant and oversensitive because of something that happened to you. Maybe you're hypervigilant and oversensitive just because you intuitively realize how bizarre it is for an eternal transcendent being called a soul to be plunged into this container and have all of its uh, default senses of spirituality completely covered up or, or um, to be bombarded with, with uh, other stimuli, with physical stimuli, and how inherently how inherently uh, stressful that is for our true self, for our true self, meaning our, our, our soul. And I do believe that chassidus, an understanding of chassidus, will help people to understand th these things more and more when, when we start to understand. Again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a mental health professional, that's not my training. Um, but I see in the world the awareness, the sensitivity, uh, the the willingness to understand different conditions. And I believe what will eventually occur is that we'll start to understand that those who are disturbed by the condition of embodiment itself are 100% correct. Those who were lucky enough to not be consciously disturbed by it, um, nobody's wishing upon them that they should suddenly develop a sensitivity, but those who do have that sensitivity, whether we want to say it's because of trauma, because of autism, Asperger's, ADD, ADHD, or, or, or whatever, um, the, these hypersensitive people who are just feeling everything more intensely, I think we're going to start to realize that that's actually not so crazy. And it's actually... If there's any problem that's a real problem in the whole world, that's the one real problem. What's the one real problem? The one real problem is that Hashem is everything. He's absolute oneness. So how in the world can I be having this experience of separate selfhood? What do I even do with that? And I think that's where the desire for self-annihilation comes from. Freud called it the death wish. He says the people want to get rid of themselves. Shakespeare spoke about Hamlet is contemplating suicide. He says to be or not to be, that is the question. He doesn't say to live or not to live. He says to be or not to be. It's not living that's the problem. It's existence. Existence means taking up space. This this podium here exists. It doesn't live, but it exists. You understand? Living means having a function. That's not, that's not so bad. Having a function, having a purpose, that's great, as long as your existence doesn't get in the way. Existence means taking up space and having an identity separate from the one, from the all. That is absolutely maddening if you think about it. So... Somebody asked me, I gave a talk, I gave many talks on this subject years ago, but one particular version of that talk, um, by virtue of peculiar, peculiarities of the internet algorithms, there was one particular talk, I guess, that got out there more than others. I think it was called How to Be Here. It was actually recorded up in Armonk in... Uh, I think it's Westchester County. doesn't even matter. The point is there was a version of a talk that I've probably given 200 times to various different audience. And um, I think the recording is from about 10 years ago. It's interesting. I saw last spring, was it last spring when the Ukraine war broke out mm -hmm. and the people were evacuating or starting to evacuate about a year ago already, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Is that when it was? Mm -hmm. It was the end of February. Okay, so it's almost a year ago now. And... A short time after that, there was an interview with a young woman, an American girl 
who had done a crazy thing because the Lubavitcher Rebbe said that if you really love every Jew and you want to show it, then go out to communities and devote your life to providing Jewish resources to Jews. And so uh, she became the shlucha together with her husband. She, be, she or they became the shluchim, the Rebbe's emissaries in Chernigov, Ukraine. So this uh, young woman, young mother, Elisa Silverstein, is speaking online. Somebody sent me. I was blown away by the interview. She's being interviewed on Chabad.org. And she's speaking about evacuating. She's a war refugee, um, evacuating with her children, having literally no place to call a home right now, living out of a backpack. Uh, and she says, you know, but Baruch Hashem, I was calm. And I'm calm right now. And she says... Um, Because, you know, Hashem is makdim refua lamaka. Hashem sends a healing before the, the disease. So she says, sometime before the war broke out, I had a difficult pregnancy. And I, I needed something to help me just to deal with all that stress. So she says, I found, and she said a perfect plug. It was perfect. It was per she said, I found a video called how to be here from Rabbi Shea's Taub on soulwords.org. Like she did it perfect. It was amazing. She even said the website name correctly. Some people say .com. I finally bought .com. If you go to soul, soulwords.com, it'll redirect to soulwords.org, but it's originally soulwords.org. She said it, it was part, it was amazing. It was amazing. Anyways, so, so she says, so I watched this, 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 this video called how to be here. And, uh, I had the tools for remaining present in my situation as stressful as it was and I was blown away by this that see here's the confession I don't talk about anything that I don't actually do that's not a confession I mean that's but I, I, would, I, would, I would hope that you would assume that of me but the confession part is the fact that I'm able to speak about Amuna and using faith as a tool for coping for going through life I could tell you what it says in the books because I'm a rabbi, but the fact that I'm able to speak about it in, a, in an experiential way is because I actually do it, okay? But here's, here's the confession part. I didn't learn how to do it because I was ever a war refugee. I was never, thank God, I grew up in Chicago. I'm, I was never a war, war refugee, okay? And thank God, I never had a traumatic upbringing. And I know today it's, it's, it's somewhat fashionable to not believe someone when they say that. No, go look again. Go look again. Go look again. I can't tell you that I ever experienced anything trauma with a capital T. But I can definitely tell you that from the time of my earliest memories, which were when I was one or one and a half, between the 12 to 18 months. Yeah, so right there, anyone who can remember being 12 months old, you know it's not normal, right? Okay, okay, right? Okay. But, I, and, and I, I remember being that young, and I remember being stressed. How could a 12-month-old be stressed? What's stressful? Childhood is a time when everybody is happy and free, and they don't have a care in the world. I was always stressed. And I remember as a little kid, I used to fall on the floor crying, sobbing, because the tag in my shirt. And my mother had to cut out the tag in the shirt, right? So I don't know if in the 70s we had terms like sensory processing disorder. Maybe we did. Or maybe I don't know. I don't make, if we did... My parents would have known it. My father's a psychologist. My mother's an educator and a speech and language uh, therapist. And uh, I'm sure they would have known it if such a term existed. But that's not the term they ever used around me. Um, they were very careful about that. To try to not make me more weird than, I, than Hashem already made me. <laughs> Remember, they gave me a, a, a childhood IQ test, and they would never tell me the results. Ad hayim, till this day, they won't, they won't tell me what I got. Um, but, yeah, I would fall on the ground crying because of the tag in my shirt. Now, 
is that trauma like being a war refugee? Certainly not, no. Thank God, no. But if you're that kind of person, then you do have to sort of figure out some type of tools for living, right? So I obviously, well, I don't know if I should say obviously, uh, but after I say it, maybe it's obvious. I don't think for anyone, spirituality is the first tool that you go to if you're having a hard time with life. I really don't think for anyone, it's the first thing you go to. And I want to tell you something. Um, <laughs> I mean, since I was a little kid, I, I grew up with ideas of faith and, and Jewish observance. That wasn't anything I ever looked to as a response to why is life so difficult. Um, I went to yeshiva. I became a rabbi. I, I, I learned all the books. I taught the books. I did not look to that as a way of handling life. I kind of looked at it as two separate things. Like, yeah, I know I'm, I'm, I, I get stressed out and life is difficult. And, and, but I'm, I'm, what does that have to do with, with, with faith? Like, why, how is faith an answer to that? Um, and it took me years to realize how to take Jewish spiritual, spiritual teachings more seriously, um, like really seriously, and to internalize them as actual tools for living. And when I did, then a lot of things started to click and a lot of things made sense. But I just, I'm just letting you know, I'm not a spiritual person. I was a rabbi for years and I did not consider, I still don't consider myself spiritual. I'm not, that's not my default. That's not, not the first place that I'm going to go. But through trial and error, I, I realized that for me to be spiritual and for me to be God conscious is not pious. It's, it's just basic functioning. Basic functioning. And if I don't do that, then it becomes very hard to deal with day-to-day -day life. So that's where my expertise, if I have any degree of expertise, that's where it comes from. It comes from just being a person who used to cry about the tags in his shirt when he was a, a kid. Okay, yeah. And can religion become the addiction? Can religion become the addiction? Well, we don't want to talk about that in public. <laughs> oh, you betcha, yeah. I was invited once to speak about addiction in Lakewood. This is maybe 10 years ago. Thank God I was, I have been invited back to Lakewood since then. <laughs> <laughs> it was your test kiss live. I was for bringing actually in Lakewood this year, which is a, a, a small wonder in and of itself. But I was, I was speaking about addiction and uh, that's the topic they gave me. I, I don't like to speak about addiction in public because I think it's so misunderstood and it's just, it's laborious for me to, to explain it because it doesn't mean at all what people think it means. Um, like I was saying before, it's not the problem. It's the best attempt at a solution to the real problem. People have a hard time with that. Maybe not in this room, but like I'm saying, this room naturally skews toward people who have more <laughs> understanding of these types of things. Um, so I, someone was, I forget what, what they were asking, but they had the typical line of questions. Like, could this be an addiction? I'm like, yes. Could this be an addiction? Yes. Could this be an addiction? Get, I said, everything can be an addiction. I said, it's not the what. It's, it's the why. Why are you using it that way? So I said, basically, ultimately, if you're using something as an escape, um, because you can't handle life as God is creating it, I used overtly religious terms because it was like what? I mean, I'm, I, th I thought I should be comfortable speaking religiously. In other audiences, I don't know if I would necessarily speak that way because um, there's no point in uh, making people uncomfortable. Uh, but to, to them, I said, look, if you're uncomfortable with living in life as God is creating it and you're using something as an avoidance tactic or ritual uh, or distraction from that, then that's an addiction, whatever it is. And so I said, like, as I thought this would be very helpful, I said, like Lima de Taira could be an addiction. A person could use delving into Taira as a way to actually avoid God.
And I don't think it went over very well. <laughs> yeah. So if you say you're not a spiritual person, yes. but you're talking about emuna, what other word would you use other than spiritual? Well, I'm not a naturally spiritual person. I'm not naturally interested in emuna. I would much prefer to be normal and not have to I would like to be a normal religion. I'd like to be religious and normal, and Amuna could be like icing on the cake of a normal life. Like when I feel like being spiritual, I could do it and then pat myself on the back and say, wow, that was meaningful. As opposed to, if I don't say Maida'ani, I'm going to get myself in serious trouble within 10 minutes of waking up. I don't want to be in that position. Okay, so what I'm saying is my spirituality is... Is, is by necessity, okay? It's like, it's like paying taxes. It's nothing that I relish. It's something that I have to do in order to function. Uh, which is, by the way, what I realized, I, I realized this long ago, that there are different types of crowds, uh, different types of crowds, and, and those people for whom spirituality is something that enhances and adds meaning to life, those people don't like me, because you know, I, I, I'm not sure exactly why, because I have a hard time reading it, I have a hard time projecting myself into that uh, perspective, but I, and I think most people, they view spirituality as, well, spirituality, of course, is not a practical thing, so obviously, if you're pursuing spirituality, you're doing it for the, the depth and the meaning and the the higher purpose, and, and I'm sitting here thinking like, no, actually, no, no, that's not, no, that's, that's, I, I wish I had that luxury. I wish I were in that position. That's not why I talk about spirituality. It's because I have a hard time doing what adults need to do to function in a world if I don't remain God conscious. So it's not a luxury for me. It's not something that enhances the meaning of my life. It's, it's, a basic tool for living. Um, and I think that there are a lot of people like that. Now, a lot of those people... Ha oh, you're, about, you're asking about religion. So for some people, religion is the distraction. Religion is the avoidance tactic. I once explained to somebody, he asked me, a uh, cynic, about isn't, isn't faith... Um, a form of, of, of self-deception. And now as I'm, I'm like thinking out loud right now as I'm talking to you, I realize now why he, why he asked that, because he's normal. Now it just clicked for me. That's why normal people are cynical. It just occurred to me. Okay, so I'll tell you what I answered him. He was saying, it isn't faith an avoidance tactic or isn't it self-deception? Uh, so I said, you know, there are two words that often get used or substituted for one another in uh, popular discourse, and that is fantasy and faith. But if you know what either of them mean, then you realize they couldn't be any farther apart from each other than they are. They're, they're actually opposites. People tend to conflate them, but really they're opposites. What's the difference between fantasy and faith? Fantasy is, is an idea that I cling to in order to avoid facing reality. Faith is an idea that I cling to in order to have the courage to face reality. They almost sound the same until you actually unpack what those words mean. They're opposites. Fantasy, I'll say it again. Fantasy is an idea that I cling to in order to avoid facing reality. Faith is an idea that I cling to in order to have the courage to face reality. Okay, so when I'm speaking about faith here, I'm not speaking about dogmatic faith. I'm not speaking about 12 principles of faith. I'm speaking about beliefs of a metaphysical nature things that we cannot empirically observe, the, the scientific method cannot demonstrate any of these things, 
Um, but they are narratives which we have as Jews because we've inherited them as an unbroken tradition, a golden chain of, of a Masada, a, tra a tradition that's come down to us. But these are metaphysical principles that we lean on, not to avoid life, but the exact opposite, to show up for life. So what does it mean to show up for life? For somebody it means she needs to pack up her kids and evacuate the town where she's lived for 10 years because there are bombs going off and she needs to do that without making her children more panicked and she needs to, she needs to be able to, to put one foot in front of the other and do something that would overburden anyone's allostatic load. And how does she do it? With faith. She tells herself, it's okay, Hashem is with me, I can do this. Not, Hashem is with me and therefore I don't have to do anything. Hashem is with me, I can do this, let me put, well, let me put one foot in front of the other. And that's called using faith as a, as a practical tool. For other people, and, and this is what I'm trying to bring out to you, and, I, and I'm, I'm sensing that this room is disproportionately sympathetic to this idea, disproportionate from the general population, um, that you will find people in society or even in your family who we observe them or, or, or identify them as having uh, disorders. And, and what I'm telling you is there's another way of looking at it, which is um, maybe these people are just more sensitive to a truth that is true for all of us objectively, but it's only that acutely an issue for these people subjectively. Okay, and therefore, and therefore, if we'll speak about the amuna that somebody with sensory integration issues has to use in order to function, I believe, I guess that's my whole premise here, that that's an incredibly effective language for speaking about amuna to a general population in a way that's accessible and relatable and feels practical. So I guess what I'm saying is that there's a lot of accidental spirituality that has emerged in various communities of people who are coping with different issues. That spirituality is a goldmine of terms and tools that the general population can learn from in order to make these very lofty ideas more relatable. So, uh, yeah, I had a whole bunch of stuff here I was going to tell you, but. Uh, <laughs> you mean like the whole, like, Hashem? What? You mean like the whole, like, Hashem? Thank you, Hashem, the whole movement? Yeah. yeah, I don't think that that's coming from people who can't cope with life without it. I think that that's a normal mainstream movement. But I think that. I would suggest, you know, I was on this uh, podcast, it's very popular, it's the crown jewel of the five towns, is the uh, Meaningful People podcast. <laughs> and uh, I will say, Nachi, I told you one thing I didn't want you to do, is don't say anything about me in the intro that would make people further mistake me for a therapist, and then you went and did it, okay? <laughs> so I'm st still correcting that. Okay, but now you guys understand, I'm not a therapist, I'm just a guy who happens to have a difficult time living life, happens to have already studied the things that would help for that, but didn't know the things I was studying. You know, when I was learning Chassidus, I was learning because that's what we do in Chabad. It didn't occur to me that these were living skills. I was looking elsewhere for living skills. Um, but, so when I was on the Meaningful People podcast, they asked me, like, what's my takeaway? What's my bottom line? I said, you know, a lot of the speaking that I do is special interest groups. Um, I don't think people realize, well, I'll tell you this, if, if you are a member of one of these groups, which are groups that most people don't want to be members of, 
I'm talking about you're a member of a, a sub category, a subsection of society um, that nobody really wants to be part of. For instance, you have a sick relative, you have an incarcerated relative, um, you have um, a, a child who's not well, um, just think of infertility. Uh, I'm just thinking about the different groups that, that, that bring me out. Okay, so nobody wants to be part of those groups. But Baruch Hashem, the Jewish community, is incredible at providing support for people who do have various different issues. And um, so a lot of the speaking that I do is I'm brought to, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've spent Shabbos in that Crown Plaza in Stamford. You know what that is? Like every group that has a brochure and a website has to do their yearly, yeah, it's not called Crown Plaza, it's called Armon. Can I get a discount at the, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, yeah, Stamford, Connecticut. So it's, it's a Jewish hotel, and I, I've been there, I don't know, I must have been there 20 times. Uh, and every time it's a different group. Um, and, and they're all special interest groups. They're groups of people who ha are, are united by some problem. The most quote-unquote normal group that I was ever there for was uh, Kite of Tuni. But you want to know something? Half the people I saw there, I'd seen at other groups. <laughs> it's a spiritual seekers, kind of Tony. It's people who are spiritual seekers. People, who, uh, people whose lives are difficult enough that they don't care about the stigma that the Orthodox community will actually find out that they are spiritual seekers. And so they say, you know what, I have nothing to lose. I'm ready to out myself as somebody who wants to find spirituality. Okay, and, and, and those two, those people, I'm telling you, they're like me. They didn't come to it for fun. Some of them did, I, and I can't relate to them. Those are the guys who sing too much, and I don't know, the Kumsitz guys. I, I don't relate to them. But most of them are there because they have a problem or a series of problems, or life itself is a problem. That's how they got there. So, uh, anyways, meaningful minute. I was, I was telling you, I'm talking to uh, Nachi Gordon, and I'm saying... Uh, What's my takeaway? Here's what I want you to know. There are so many groups like this, people who are going through issues. And what I tell them, what I tell every group I speak to, um, is that a lot of rabbis come and try to give chizuk to these groups that they identify as being weak, you know, and that's not an insult to call them weak. It's just saying, look, you're going through a lot, uh, you, 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 and you need to be lifted. So I, I'm here to give you chizuk. And that's the way the most rabbis speak to them. I don't speak to them that way. I say that, you know, in school, they give you the lesson, and then you get the test. In life, they give you the test, and then you get the lesson. Or like Chazal say, Ein chochem kabal nesoyin. There's no one as wise as someone who's gone through the school of hard knocks. Nesoyin often is translated as experience, but it's more than an experience. And nesoyin means a trial, a test. So I always tell them, listen, you didn't volunteer for this, but the reality is that you have this intense stress in your life. And you're still with us. You're here. And you're functioning. And even if you're going to claim you're not functioning well, it's okay. I mean, I get it. We all have better days. We have worse days. But the reality is, you're still, you're still here. You're showing up. You're, you're spending a Shabbos. You know, you, you got out of the house and you did something. You, you, you're here. You're here. That's a victory. I don't know if everybody understands that, but somebody who's going through something that's a prolonged stressful situation, whether it's, you know, any of these, these groups that I speak to, whether it's people, couples married for 10 years with infertility, that's a prolonged stressful situation. 
your families where you have a child who's not only off the derech but an incredibly dangerous in a crisis situation and it's going on for years or, or, or where they, you have somebody with a prolonged illness god forbid you know cancer and th- these things are are stressful uh, these things are very stressful and you you get out of the house and and you come to this event and and you decide i'm going to have a meaningful Shabbos, you guys are heroes. But here's the thing, that means you are the teachers. You are the teachers. And how often do I hear people complaining within the Orthodox community that the way they hear spirituality spoken of is not, it doesn't feel relevant. Or, or, or people will complain, and this, this to me is an indication that their complaint is sincere. It's not just an excuse. They'll say, why do I have to read secular self-help books to find inspiration? Why do I feel like well, people who say that, that shows that they're sincere? Because it's not just somebody who doesn't want inspiration. They, act, they clearly do when they, when they don't find it in Yiddishkeit. So then they keep looking and they, until they think they found it. And what I say to these groups is, God gave you a difficulty to force you to have to learn how to live life on expert mode. Like you're playing the video game at, at, at the toughest setting. And you're still in the game. That means that we need you to go back to your community and you need to speak to your friends and your neighbors about what faith means. Anyone who's going through difficulty and handling it with grace, if you're here tonight, if you have a prolonged stressful issue in your life and you're here, you got dressed, you left the house, you're sitting here, you're a hero. But that's not enough that you're a hero. You have a duty. And that is, I promise you, I promise you, how do I know, how can I promise this to you? Because I'm speaking about myself now. You have a way of speaking about spirituality and faith that is going to sound more relevant and practical and actionable than somebody who's just trying to take it from the books and translate it into English. You're not translating it into English, you're translating it into life. And, and therefore, you are the communicators, you are the teachers. There's a, there's a paradigm of the, I guess it's something of a trope, of the wounded healer, which I guess is supposed to be something of an irony. How can he heal if he's wounded? Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know anyone capable of emotional healing who's not wounded. I, how can someone who's emotionally wounded be an emotional healer? I don't know anyone who's an effective mo- emotional healer who's not emotionally wounded. That's like the first prerequisite. I'm not saying that we should find the person who's the most dysfunctional basket case who can barely get their life together and say, teach me. (laughs) Give me advice. I don't mean that. But I mean the people who are living in spite of some factor or factors which place extra burden upon the allostatic load that they are carrying from a, on a day-to-day basis. And here's the thing, not everybody advertises their problems. But if for whatever reason you know somebody who is going through some type of prolonged stressful situation, or who's not neurotypical and therefore life itself is a prolonged stressful situation, okay? then these are the people who need to be given a platform. These are the people who need to be asked to share their experience. And and I think that the professional teachers of faith will learn a lot from the amateur teachers of faith. Professionals, like I used to be a professional, I'd speak about faith because I was a rabbi. I had to speak about it. What else am I supposed to speak about? And 
and then I went through my own experiences of realizing everything they had taught me in yeshiva was what I needed in order to be able to function. And then I was able to speak about it to other people in a totally different way. Yeah, so... If you're in this room, I think you could probably identify to everything, identify with everything I'm saying on at least one level. At least one level. And what I'd encourage you to do is... I don't want to take much more time here, but maybe leaving this room tonight, think about ways in which, by necessity, uh, you have become a more spiritual person in your day-to-day -day life. Not because it's the right thing, not because it's noble, not because you think that's what you're supposed to do, but think about ways in which having a, a relationship with God, talking to God, um, thinking about God, thinking about divine providence, thinking about the oneness of all creation. Uh, I would ask you to consider ways in which you may take for granted, you probably do take for granted, that those tools are, are allowing you to live. And I think you should then identify that as a skill set that you have, which is extremely valuable, and that you wouldn't want anyone else to have to pr pay the price of admission to have to, to gain. Would you want somebody else to have to go through what you went through in order to know what you know? I can't imagine anyone who's spiritually sensitive would want anyone else to, to suffer at all. So if we can spare other people suffering by sharing what we know, then, then we have a duty to do that, yeah. Yeah, but you're being God's attorney. <laughs> or I'm getting nervous that you're being God's attorney. You're saying that people go through difficult things in order to make them grow. I, I, I don't want to say that. I'm saying something almost, I'm like close to what you're saying, but different. Because I, I, I don't need to be God's attorney. Um, I'm saying that clearly, if you've been through stuff, you've grown. I'm saying it as a fact. I'm not justifying it. Oh, you want to grow? Hey, let's get some suffering in her life and help her grow. Not suggesting it. I'm saying it more like, look, if you've been through stuff, you've grown. Like I said, in Chochem Kabal Nasai. Okay, so you know some stuff now. Okay, that's just a fact. What are you going to do with the stuff that you know? That's all I'm saying. You know things because of whatever experiences you went through. You wouldn't wish on somebody else to know it that way. So share what you know. That's what, that's what I'm saying. Almost saying exactly what you said. I think that the practical outcome is the same. Okay, so that was a pretty good description of the problems that a lot of us face. But we didn't speak about the solution. So I'm going to invite you to watch the third lecture in this series where we're going to really focus on the implementation of practical tools for faith that will help us achieve better balance in our day-to-day -day lives. That should be here. Right here. I think it's here.